The title today of the sermon is Rejoice in the Lord Always. And uh, during today's sermon, we're going to look at what Paul is saying, what God has revealed to Paul. And the promises are so astounding that it, that it takes God's faith to believe in what we are promised. And as we, as we just sang in that song, that uh, as believers, we rejoice and that we stand on and we believe every promise of God. That's what we're, that's what we are, that's what we will do, that's what we will, we're called to do. And during the sermon, we're going to expound on that very subject of why rejoice in the Lord always. And uh, so we'll have the scripture reading uh, by Terry this morning. And the scripture reading is from uh, Philippians 4, 4 to 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. These are the words of the living God. Thank, Thank you, you that we can rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Well, as we think about these verses in Philippians, it's important to notice how often the following phrases are found in the book of Philippians alone. And um, in the Lord is found ten times, just in that four chapters of the book of Philippians. In Jesus, that is found once. And in Christ, is found, that's found in seven times. So just in that four chapters of that book of, of the epistle of, to the Philippians, in the Lord, in Jesus, in Christ, is found 18 times. And that says a lot. And uh, so as we look at the, 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 the context of these verses that we've just read, that Terry have just read, you know, the beginning of chapter talks, Paul encourages two women who were very, very faithful in the Lord. They were fellow workers, God tells, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us. And uh, what happens is that these women had some kind of a disagreement. The Bible doesn't really tell us what the disagreement is, but he tells them to, he encourages them to agree in the Lord. Because in the Lord, when we have disagreements, you know, we can find agreement, we can find unity, we can find ways of resolving difficulties. And then the Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So Paul, this is a, a commandment that is in a way uh, very funny funny or impossible to reach from a human point of view without understanding what Paul is getting at because to rejoice always what does that mean God does not say that when we go the Apostle Paul does not say that when we go through trials necessarily to rejoice in that because Paul oftentimes had sadness that sometimes he felt abandoned by the brethren. A and he wanted <laughs> Timothy, for example, to come to him and he, 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 he wanted that support. And Paul was, I, I'm sure he would have preferred, rather than be in prison in Rome and, and being uh, held by soldiers, he would have much preferred to be free. That is, because I've never met a prisoner yet and I've met several who say to me, who said to me, hooray, 
I'm in jail and I can't wait. To, I, I hope I stay here the rest of my life. I've never heard anybody say that. In fact, they want to get out as soon as they can. So, but, uh, so the Apostle Paul is telling us to rejoice because we are in the Lord. In Philippians 1, 12 to 14, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonments, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he, he says, all the rest, that my imprisonment is in Christ. So everyone who was in that prison, in that jail, the guards and everybody, they all knew that Paul was there because of Christ. And in fact, it encouraged the other brethren to be, more, to be bold about Jesus, to be bold and to follow Paul's example, that Paul would go to that extent that he was that convinced about the good news of Jesus, that it just empowered, if you will, the other brethren to, to share in that. So, again, Paul was probably in Rome at the time. There's, there are other commentaries that say that maybe he was in Colossae or some other place, but he was probably in Rome. Paul rejoiced, he could say rejoice always because he knew that God was working something absolutely marvelous in our life and in the life of all people who would believe in Jesus Christ. And Paul could rejoice because he knew he was in the Lord. He, was, he had no doubt that he was in communion with God. So what are some of the reasons Paul encourages us to rejoice in the Lord always? Well, the, in the book of Acts, when Jesus intervened dramatically in the life of Paul, he was on his way to Damascus. And as he was describing what happened to him, he said in Acts 26.13, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, <coughs> brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And we have to remember that Jesus, that Paul, did not see Jesus in the flesh while he was walking on the earth. He, he, just, he saw the resurrected Jesus. And he learned a lot, he, he learned a lot about the history of what had happened from the apostles, from Peter and John and, and James and the others, because he described them as pillars in the church. But uh, the F.F. Bruce says, the earthly Jesus was a man of woman born who endure, endured a real death, but the risen Christ, while still man, was now vested with heavenly humanity, a different order of humanity from that of this present life. So when he saw Jesus, he was vested in, with heavenly humanity. I like that phrase, that he was dressed with heavenly humanity. And his heavenly humanity, he shone like the sun. Well, you might say, well, what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with us? So he, the apostle Paul, goes on to describe what it has to do with us because it has a lot to do with us. Uh, the Apostle Paul, for example, says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, he says, the first man was made from the dust of the earth. However, the second man, Jesus, is from heaven. So the first man, Adam, was made from the dust of the, the ground. Because when, it's, it's easy to prove that, because when we die and we rot, or whatever, <laughs> put it bluntly, we go back to the dust. That's, that's what happens. But Jesus, the Apostle Paul says, we shall also bear 
the image of the man of heaven. We will also bear the image of the man of heaven. Now, if you stop to think about that, that is a very powerful statement because we have difficulty in our life to see us, ourselves in the flesh right now, one day shining like Jesus. But that's what's going to happen to us at the resurrection. And, uh, you know, when Paul was defending himself for being a follower of Jesus, one of the, I forget the name of the man, he, he said, Paul, in other words, you, what's happening to you that you believe these things? And these things appear foolish to the human mind, to, to us as human beings, that one day we're going to shine, that we're going to be like Jesus, that we'll bear the image of the man of heaven. Who's the man of heaven? Jesus. He's vested in heavenly clothing. He's vested in heavenly beauty, if you will. We are going to participate in that one day. And Jesus, when Paul saw Jesus, he saw Jesus in a glorified state. He, he, saw, he saw Jesus in dazzling light. And he's not the only one to have seen Jesus in dazzling light like that. If you remember at the Transfiguration, uh, Peter, James, and John, his brother, saw Jesus in a similar way. They, if you remember the Transfiguration, um, we, we can read that in Matthew 17, 1 to 2. He says, And after six days John took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. So Paul was not the only one to, say the, to see the glorified Jesus. Peter, James, and John saw him as well. So we have the testimony of four people right there who saw Jesus in that way. Now, when Jesus came to the earth, back to the earth, and, and, had, and ate fish, for example, with the apostle, he did not come in that bright light. He came as an ordinary human being, and he ate with them. They recognized him. And so the apostle John tells us something absolutely amazing. And I, he says, beloved, we are, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. I don't know if you ever thought of that, that you're going to be like Jesus. And uh, how is Jesus? Well, Jesus shines in an absolutely dazzling light. He's like the sun. It, it, it's it's sh shown more than the sun, it, it basically says. So we are going to be like him. That's the promise that we have at the resurrection. So because our, we're going to be changed. And I know as we read these verses, we maybe we so, well, you know, as we, as we get up in the morning and we need to shave and we need to take a shower and all of that, we don't think usually that that's our future, that we are going to be shining in heavenly light like Jesus is. But that is our future. So these are amazing words, and if you were to tell somebody on the street, do you know your future in Christ? That you're going to shine one day like the sun. You know, you're, you're going to be as bright as the sun one day when Jesus returns. If you simply believe in, if you believe in him and trust him for your, for your life, what do you think people would answer?
Pardon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we might answer Looney Tunes, yeah. But that, that is the truth of the gospel, though. That's what the Bible is teaching us. And so, and we believe that because as amazing as these words are, we know that they are, that our hope is based on Jesus, who is the truth, the way, and the life. And the beautiful thing about the Bible is that the Bible is consistent. The apostles, Paul did not say, you know, Peter and John and James were lying. Very independent visions of Jesus, if you will, or they saw Jesus transfigured. All of them, you know, the, these four independently. And they were willing to give their lives for what they believe, for what they saw. You know, how many people would give their life for a lie? None. You know, you don't, you don't, we, we would not give your, our life for a hoax. Because they were convinced it was true. And uh, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Apostle Paul describes him the following way. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. And who is the one medi mediator between God and man? It's the man, Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Timothy 2, 5, 2, 5 says. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is both God, he's both man in his one nature. So on the one side, he's one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he receives, he's also a man. And in him, we are going to resemble the man Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches us. So the Apostle Paul tells us about our future reign with Jesus. He He says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and fellow heirs or co-inheritors with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we are co-inheritors with Jesus. And we are going to be glorified with him. This is the promise that God is giving us. And, and, and the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, says, But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say that we are the temple, the sanctuary of God. The Holy Spirit living in us, God living in us. And we live in him. So it's, these are amazing scriptures, tremendously encouraging that just lifts our eyes of faith so, so high that the present problems pale into comparison. It's, it's worth going through this life to have what God has promised for us. It's really, it's amazing. So, our glorious future in Christ. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Jesus will transform our lowly bodies, our aching bodies, our growing old bodies, 
to be like his glorious body. That is the future that we have. And we have to ask, well, can it get any better than that? Can it get any better? So that's why people, the Apostle Paul could say, rejoice always, because he knew what our future in Jesus would be. So what happens is that as we suffer, it's not pleasant suffering. Suffering is not equal pleasant. It's not a, a synonym for suffering pleasant. The, the, the two don't go together. But yet, when we believe what Jesus is saying, the problems we go through in life, and we know the future that we have, it's worth suffering in Christ to receive that tremendous reward. And God has a plan for us. God is always at work. He, he, he wants us to have, God the Father wants us to have a relationship with Jesus and a relationship that is going to last for eternity. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is at work revealing Jesus to people as in his plan. So that is, it's, in, it's wonderful. So when we go through this stage in life, if we can just remember the future that we have, God will give us the strength to be able to go through these things. So if we, if we look at the philosophies of, the, of this world, they certainly do not capture what God has in store for believers in Jesus. In fact, so if we look at what do some of the philosophies of the world teach, well, they teach that it's impossible for anyone else to define you. So we define ourselves. And you are born with everything you need. And, you know, that's taken from the website, and there's all kinds of Eastern new spirituality that teaches that. So. That would be very uh, discouraging if it's that there's no one else who can define me. <laughs> because I know I'm going to die, and if there's nothing <coughs> more beyond me, then I'm doomed. And I know I was not born with everything I need. For example, I, if I was left alone on the earth, It's a stupid, it, it's, it's really when you think of it, it's kind of a stupid saying because we need one another. We need to be in relationship with one another. Even as I got up this morning, I, I, I relied on a lot of people I do not know. I ate toast and I don't know who made the bread. But I rely on them and uh, I relied on farmers this morning and because of some of the things that I ate. They all grew it. So, you know, and I, I wouldn't know how to provide those needs for myself. So I'm certainly not born with everything I need, and neither are you. What would men do without women? <coughs> or what would women do without men? Some might say, well, it might be a better world. But in reality, <laughs> in reality, that's, that's not the case. It, we, would, we, we need one another. We're created for relationship. Ravi Zachariah wrote a, a book recently. It's, it's called Why Jesus Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass Marketed Spirituality. And he says... At the time, most people failed to understand the power of the media to change their views and reshape their thinking. Instead of, of viewing the world through the medium of television, they allowed the medium to define the world for them. He says, there's a war raging. It is a battle for thought and belief 
through a weapon of mass de deconstruction. In that battle, it's not firepower we need to fear as much as the electronic power. From the conscious to the subconscious, we are in his grip. <coughs> From wars in different lands to battles for moral acceptability, the television sets has won the day. Said, I stress this because I believe that almost none of the new spiritualities would be so pervasive if it were not for the genius and building distortion of television. It reinforces what we want to believe, and if what, what we want to believe is what we are told to believe, through the medium, no amount of logical arguments can shake that conviction. Whichever, you may want, whichever way you want to look at it, television, and now viral media is the shaper of everything we think and believe. And I know that's a pretty strong statement that he's saying, but think about it. You know, um, we believe, uh, we see a lot of things through the words, through the world of the eye, through the world of TV, and it shapes people's thinking. It really does. Last night, I, I remember when I was young, for example, we used to have toy revolvers, and we, have to ha we, we had a holster. And we would, you know, we saw on television how the cowboys at that time would just twirl their revolvers and then put it in their holster. And we all did that. Uh, you know, we were influenced by television. And um, I remember a story of, of a man who, you know, they were playing. And uh, there was one guy, for some reason, he was the unlucky chosen. And they built a noose, and they were going to hang him. And um, so some adult came and said, what are you doing? But these kids had no idea of what would happen. Because on TV, you know, in the next show, nothing would happen to <coughs> these guys that were, you know, they would appear in other shows as other actors. <laughs> so they did not die. So it's just an unreal world, and it, it, it affects our thinking. <coughs> Last night, or the day before, we were watching a program on BBC television, and we saw a man walking through the Himalayas, walking from, he walked all the way to Pakistan and, and uh, to India and to the shrine and some of the, the religions of the East that, that we saw. And we saw how people live, they walk, people walk miles and miles to go to these pilgrimage. And one man was lying in a religious fervor he was lying, he, he, would, he would throw himself on the ground and somebody would put a stick in front of him and then he would get up and go on the other side of the stick and, and lie, lie again until he got to this pilgrimage and it was miles that he would do that. I'm sure he was in shape uh, <laughs> got when he got to the end. But what happens if it was not for TV we would not know that world. My grandfather would not, did not know that world because TV was not developed. It, it changes our thinking. It changes our thinking. Now, I'm not saying that television is all bad because there's a lot of good in television, but I'm saying, you know, there's a mixture of both like in this world. And we, the, the Eastern religions have invaded our our vocabulary. It's not uncommon to hear such words as mantra. Maybe you've heard that. Sh chakra. Karma. Nirvana. Karma. All these words are in our common vocabulary. They all come from the Eastern religions. They don't come from Christianity. And although we don't, do not exactly know what they mean, we use them anyway. We'll say, well, that person is receiving good things because it's karma, or he's receiving bad things because it's karma. 
but in reality, that word comes from a meaning of people being reincarnated and, you know, until they reach nirvana, <laughs> the, the, that state of being one with the universe. That's what it means. And even if you're in that heaven, from what I read in religious history, it, it's only good for a time. Once your karma is gone, you have to start all over again. And sometimes you start maybe as a cow or as a monkey or whatever it is. But, you know, that's, and, and we're adopting that kind of thinking in our society. So, and, and we see God's moral standards being disrespected, being dissed, making sin and immorality appear to be normal. It just appears to be normal. So what, what does Jesus say about what we see? Because the eyes are very important, and that knowledge comes through our eyes. This is what Jesus says. <coughs> he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the darkness in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So it's essential for us to f not to focus on the darkness of this world, but to focus on, the, on Jesus and the good news of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus, God the Father loves us so much, he sent his son to deliver this good news of the kingdom of God. And he's, this, the kingdom of God, which is already here, working in his church, one day is going to transform the whole world. I can say that because that's what Jesus tells us. It's the good news he came to bring. So let's go back to, go, I'm going to go quickly through this because time is racing on. But So the sec what is the secret of peace? Well, Paul tells us, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts in your minds in Christ Jesus. So in verse 5, when he talks about let uh, your reason reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. It may refer to the second coming, but probably it refers to the nearness of God right now. That, that God is near. He's, we abide in him. He abides in us. And uh, so we can, Jesus invited us to go to him anytime because his rest, to have rest. That's what he tells us. So it's, it's they, so, and he tells us, that in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So God wants us to pray to address our concerns to him. And uh, to do that in our daily lives. And it, as we pray, it helps us to have the proper frame of mind, if you will. And Paul tells us how to have that proper frame of mind. You know, in psychology... It's not related to God, but people will say, well, you know, if you write at the end of the day, if you write three things that you are thankful for, you know, it's going to help you overcome worry, which is true. But it's not done in the Lord. It's done just like that. But when we are thankful as God's people, we are thankful to someone. We are not thankful to the universe. We are thankful to God. We are thankful to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are thankful to Jesus for what he has done. And there are so many things that we can be thankful for, too many to, to enumerate, really. But we can be thankful for that he has, that we are created in the image of God. We can be thankful that we get, we, for the gift of human relationships, which is precious. We can thank him for the gift of husband and wife, the gift of marriage, the gift of friendship, the gift of hope that we, God has given us so richly, the immense love that he has for us, the answered prayers in our life, because God has answered many prayers in our lives. Thank him for that. 
And uh, so that places us in a, in a place, if you will, where we can receive his peace because his peace is a gift. Jesus gives, I give you my peace, not as the world gives, but it's the peace of Jesus. So it just helps us to be in a receptive mind to receive the peace of Jesus, to receive him because he is peace. He is the prince of peace. So, and it's a peace that transcends all understanding, Paul says. And uh, F.F. Bru says, transcending all our mental capacity to grasp and to appreciate. We know we have that peace, which is hard to explain, but we know it's a gift of God. And sometimes that peace is troubled because of our world and we are still fighting sinfulness in our human bodies. But as we, as we prepare our minds to receive Jesus, that peace just grows and grows. And I know it grows in you because I see it. So we, that is how we participate in the life of Jesus Christ, in what he is doing in our lives and in the lives of others. So he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true and whatever is honorable and whatever is just and whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely and whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So he tells us to fill our minds with whatever is true, whatever is honorable, what it, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just. It describes what is in conformity with God's way, who God is and his way of thinking. Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable of good report, whatever is excellent, you know, moral excellence, you know, it, and it, it, sin robs us from our life, uh, robs us of life. The virtues of God give us life. We grow in that. So, so we are to, Paul tells us to think about these things, to have, to focus on these things, and all of, we know this because the Bible tells us how to think. It's God's gift to us, really, the Bible, because it's God's way of communicating with us. Jesus is the Word, and He communicates through His Word. And then he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So in a way, it is an encouragement for us to study God's word, to know what God thinks. If we were to ask anyone, you know, what is the most important book that you have in your library? Well, really, the most important book that we have in our library is God's Word. It's the Bible. And we have to ask, well, do I give it that importance in my life? The Word, the communication of God to me, because it's... And I realize that God... But that's the way we are to grow in grace and knowledge, by the faith that leads to obedience, Paul talks about. So, so knowing the future in Jesus, knowing the tremendous, that this life is not the end, that there's a life of eternity where we're going to be, that our bodies are going to be transformed at the resurrection in the likeness of Jesus, the glorified Jesus. You know, let us rejoice and be thankful to God whether things go good or bad in our life. So, it, it, and we'll receive that peace that surpasses understanding that the Apostle Paul talks about. So let us pray. Father God, we pause before you at this particular time, so very thankful for the wonderful promises that we find in your word. And we know they are true. And we know, Father, that as we read these words and as we read your, your promises found in you, and as we are united with you in faith, that you are the one who is transforming us as we participate with you. Help us, Father, 
to always, every one of us, to always remember this tremendous future that awaits us in you, that we will be in relationship with you through the man Jesus for all eternity, living a life of love and pure bliss, sinless, not fighting sin anymore and evil because they won't exist. And we just want to praise you as we take communion in a few minutes because we know you abide in us and we abide in you through your grace, mercy, and wonderful humility. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.